boy, when I started working at, uh, at Terrafugia, uh, I was talking with George about that. I, I had been working on hybrid electric uh, trucks at XL Hybrids, which is now XL Fleet. And uh, I was talking with, with George and he said, oh, we have this group that gets together. And uh, would you be interested in talking about flying cars? Um, and so, yeah, of course I said, yes, cause I'll do anything George asks, um, or Christina for that matter. And, uh, so, um, I started thinking about it a little bit and then, you know, a year passed or, or something as the last year has done. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he got back to me in maybe because, uh, Tara Fuji was in the news we basically spent all of 2019 uh, working on a full FAA certification and uh, for, the, for the flying car up in Nashua, New Hampshire. The company's out of Woburn. Uh, we're in Nashua, New Hampshire. And so we were very, very busy. Uh, and we had just, it, it got in the news because we had finally achieved uh, our FAA certification uh, very early in January. And um, between the time that I said yes, and he started telling me about scheduling something for March, uh, the parent company of Terra Fuji, Geely Holdings in China, decided that, well, congratulations on achieving your uh, certification. We're not going to be doing any more development on flying cars. And so uh, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> now doing this as an ex-employee. <laughs> um, so I talked with uh, the general manager there who is also a Lexingtonian and uh, got permission to do this. And uh, I could probably could have dived deep, could dive deeper into some Terra Fugia things, but I'm limiting it to what they've publicly released. Uh, my background is, uh, working on electric vehicles, uh, an electrical engineer and software engineer, uh, and then moved into managing electrical engineering and software engineering projects. Uh, there was not much, I started out working on electric cars at GE, and then there really wasn't much business on that. So I've worked on uh, systems for medical electronics, mercury computer systems, Kronos, uh, doing factory data collection systems and things like that. Um, and then in 2008, uh, A123 Systems started providing batteries and battery systems for electric vehicles again. And it was local and it was making money. So I moved over to uh, A123 Systems and started working on uh, uh, battery systems, test systems, and the batteries for uh, the Orion 7 hybrid bus, which was used extensively, probably still is, in New York City. Perfect for uh, an electric hybrid because it's a lot of stop and go. So, uh, and from there, I've been working on electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles since then at a few different companies in the area. So, anyhow, I can, I can start in. I got some contact information here if you have good job leads. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Terra Fuji and their flying car, but mostly an overview because it's in the news so much. And uh, I think there's a there's some interesting aspects to everything going on in the industry. So this is my my starting outline. Uh, brief history of flying cars and air taxis. So a little bit specific on Terra Fuji. Uh, some of the recent vehicles, and then a little bit more about all the different ways that these, there's hundreds of companies working on these things. There's a big variation of vehicle types. There's a variation of vehicle design. Uh, there's a variation, there's a variety of fuels being used. And then to some extent, there's a reality check. I figured that there might be some some people in this group who might be interested in investments. Uh, there's all these special purpose acquisition companies investing billions of dollars in a set of these companies. And there's a lot of mergers going on uh, within these things. So 
a reality check might, I thought might be a useful thing to discuss. Any, and it's a fairly short presentation. So uh, I'm open to questions and, and uh, I'll be judicious about not having them go on too, too long so I can get through this, but uh, feel free to ask questions as I go through. Um, so the history of flying cars really goes back to the beginning of flying vehicles. Uh, very early on, uh, Curtis, one of the early, one of the pioneers in, in airplanes, um, worked on this, uh, let's see, you can't, can you see my cursor when I move around? But the, the top center vehicle is Curtis's design for a triplane uh, with a car uh, attached. Uh, I don't think he ever built that, but uh, the, so the history goes way back. There's a, there's a historical element of a uh, French vehicle, which instead of driving the wheels, had a large propeller in the, I think it was the front of the plane, uh, but it was only meant for driving. It wasn't really meant for flying, although I'm, I'm guessing that the, the inventor probably had that in the back of his mind. Uh, so you'll, there are some examples of that, which he built and drove around Paris. Uh, for a little bit of time. So it, the history goes way back on flying cars. Um, in the 40s, there was another serious effort uh, at Convair out in San Diego. And I'm familiar with this because my father was involved. He was a, an aeronautical engineer. And uh, that's this, this one here, which is basically a car with a, with a, uh, airplane glued to the top actually I think it the, you could take it to a hangar and remove the you could remove the airplane part and drive it on the streets uh, that was a conveyor there was a 116 and a 118 and uh, I think when my father got out of college uh, they hired him in I think as an intern to do an aerodynamic analysis there just weren't that many aerodynamicists at the time and he did an aerodynamic analysis on the vehicle and concluded that its uh, stall speed was the same as its top speed, which is not good for an airplane. Uh, it means you're, the best you can do is be near death <laughs> when you're in the air. Um, but I think they made some refinements to the, one, to the 118 and they actually built it and flew it. Um, and uh, I think there was some crash after a land, after a safe landing, but it was, it was somewhat capable flying car at that point. Uh, and then there was one that's been considered one of the more successful flying cars, the Taylor Aero car. And that's the one over here on the right in the yellow. And I think they built, you know, maybe 10 or 20 of these. They may have even sold a few. Um, so that, that, that's the success story. And I believe again, the, you, you'd take it to a hangar and remove the wings and, uh, and you could drive it on, on streets. So Excuse me, was this done in conjunction at all with the government? So that if you actually built one of these things and put it in the air, you didn't violate all kinds of laws. I don't know how many laws there were back then. I don't think there really were a I lot mean, of rules. 1917, but, but by after the Second World War, I'm sure there were laws about things in the air. Um, I think there were some safety checks. I really don't, I couldn't, I, I could look that up, but uh, I'm not aware, nor have I ever heard the discussion of what the, the rules are. Uh, along those lines. Uh, some of it was just doing it to do it. I think a lot of the proposed use was in places that uh, didn't have that many airports. And so there's, you know, in rural America, uh, there's a lot less, uh, there are a lot fewer rules or a lot of people to, fewer people to check up on you, is my guess. Um, but I don't think they were flown very much. The, the practicality is, as we'll get to in the, in the later section is, you know, 
everybody sort of, there's always the story of, I want my electric car, where's, or I want my flying car, where's my flying car? They told me I'd have one in popular science in the, in the 50s. And I, the Jetsons had one, how come I don't have one? And the answer I usually ask people is, what would you do with a flying car, really? And, and so I think that that may have limited its use um, and limited uh, government concern over, over that. I, you know, I've seen those cars that are uh, converted into uh, floating cars and they drive them down the Charles River in the Charles River every now and again. And I wonder if there's, if there's a lot of regulation on that as well. So I don't have a good answer for you on, on that. But I will say that for Terra Fugia uh, and the TF1, the, the regulatory issues have consumed the company since 2009. Uh, the Department of Transportation is very, very uh, strict about what you can put on a road, on a highway. Uh, and the FAA is extremely strict about what's, what you can get up in the air. And there had to be uh, special categories made, one of them being the light sport designation, light sport aircraft, uh, almost specifically for Terra Fugia to be able to get something certified. So the uh, over here on the right is the, uh, is the Terra Fugia TF-1. And also on the lower left, you can see it with the wings folding. So it's, uh, it, it had an advantage over a lot of the previous things like the tailor in that you didn't have to unscrew bolts to take the, take the uh, wings off and other parts of the tail off, uh, like on those vehicles. Basically, you would fold the wing, push the button, fold the wings up and drive over to the gas station. Uh, and fill it up and drive. So it, it had some real advantages and, and there is a real, there, there is much more of a value chain and they got a bunch of people to sign up to put deposits down on, on the TF1, even as early as 2009, um, and then built the second version, the one that you're seeing in these pictures, well, in the, in the bottom picture, uh, 2012, uh, the one on the on the right side uh, was taken a few months ago up in Nashua, so that's our that's the current vehicle. So then, another other vehicles like it are the Pal V, and the Pal V is in the middle here. It's it's a three wheeler uh, with uh, it, it's basically like a gyrocopter but it's a pretty interesting vehicle. The blade, again, the blades fold up so that you, you uh, they get out of the way for driving. Uh, and the interesting thing about the three wheeler is from the department of, uh, from the DOT's point of view, it's not a car. Uh, it's, it's a motorcycle. And so it is not subject to needing airbags, uh, or wheel disc brakes, um, all, all sorts of TPMS systems, uh, rear cameras, all those things that cars need today. Uh, you don't need on one of these and the licensing is much, much simpler. So a lot of the headaches we tried dealing with on the TF1, uh, we could have avoided if we went to three wheels instead of four wheels. Um, but that, that would have required a lot of design changes. So that didn't happen. Isn't this picture showing four wheels? Uh, the the one in the center, the red, is a three wheel. So you have one wheel in the front and two in the back. So that's the Pal V. The next on the list, and I'm, I'm after these two. Terra Fuji was really the first one, and you know, in the current market, going going after this, and they were they showed that the New York uh, Auto Show. Um, in the around uh, 2010, uh, Pal V came on a little later. They're, they're European origin, and then Terrafugio started really driving 
uh, a lot more interesting vehicles. Uh, they went into this here. Uh, these two pictures in the bottom were the TFX. So they were trying to get away from needing to go to the airport by having vertical takeoff. So uh, the idea was you would you would tilt the just the rotors enough to get up in the air, then tilt them forward and feather them. And then these, these arms would be wings and you'd have a little lifting body activity from the vehicle itself with a pusher fan in the back. And then you fly to your destination and then flip up your, uh, your rotors again and do a vertical landing. So the, the car part, you know, you sort of say, well, if you're doing that, why do you need a car? Why do you need to drive? And uh, the, historically, the, the, va the implied value of the original TF1 flying car was that a lot of pilots do not want to have their, uh, their planes left at the airport. They don't like dealing with hangars or tying it down in weather. They'd much prefer being able to drive at home and leaving it there. Not that they would ever take this kind of a vehicle or, or the TF1 to the corner grocery store to pick up groceries and come back. It's really just to get to the airport. And, and the second part is that with uh, most, most uh, general aviation pilots don't have um, instrument ratings. So a lot of times what happens is people want to take their buddies up to go golfing in New Hampshire. They go to Hanscom, they take their plane, they go to New Hampshire, uh, they golf, they get back to the airport. And um, uh, so part of the hassle is that they may or may not be able to find a taxi to take them to the golf course. Uh, so they'd like to be able to drive to the golf course when they get to the destination, if, depending on the, the rental car availability, wherever they're going. But secondly, when they get back to the airport, the weather may have turned either in New Hampshire or in Massachusetts. And so now they're stuck. Uh, and they have to pay someone hundreds of dollars to, because, you know, these are people who own airplanes or tend to be rich people. And uh, so they're paying a taxi to drive them from northern New Hampshire or upstate New York or somewhere back to Massachusetts. Uh, so they prefer the option of being able to drive back, even though it's not an ideal vehicle to drive. It's like a, an awkward pickup truck. Uh, they would still prefer to be able to do that and not be stuck wherever they've flown to earlier in the day. And so the, the, the ability to drive even with something like TFX with a vertical takeoff has value. Uh, the problem was that this conceptually uh, from an uh, aerodynamic modeling point of view would not have flown, I think, at all. And so... That, would, that never really happened. And Terrafugia sh shifted over to the TF2 model, which was with eight rotors, vertical takeoff, and then two rotors pushing. Uh, you still get your vertical takeoff. You, with all those, all those rotors, you, you uh, have a, purely, a better load capability. You might be able to get you know, four, maybe more passengers, depending on your, your motors. Um, and they wanted to differentiate themselves from helicopters by having a concept where there was a, a three-part system. So there would be an electric car and then a pod, which could be either passengers or cargo. And the idea is that you would pick up your, your you would call an Uber, something like an Uber, and you get in your electric bus here with the passenger pod on it and that drives you over to the airport where you can where you transfer the pod to the uh, the tf2 airframe it flies you to midtown manhattan uh, drops the pod onto another uber shuttle and then that drives you to midtown so you could you know, start your book or do your get your laptop out 
at your house and then you wouldn't have to wait in any lines, do anything else. You're just sitting in your, in your seat uh, for whatever time it takes to get to the airport, fly to New York and then get to your final destination where you finally, you can uh, pack your laptop up or finish your book. And so it was a, a very interesting concept uh, and, and there's actually a fair number of, of, uh, of these air taxi companies uh, with a, a model that, that's a little bit like this in that um, you, you've got the vertical takeoff and then uh, fixed propulsion going forward. And so that's a, a little bit of the history of where, what sort of has shaped the market right now. Um, there's a bunch of companies, I'd say hundreds, uh, working on varieties of these vehicles today. It's really, there's just tremendous amount of investment in this. Uh, and now a little bit about Terrafugia. Yeah, qu question? Uh, no. no. What, what is the typical top speed, speed for these vehicles? Uh, they're typically a little over 100 miles an hour, maybe 110, 120 knots. And um, what's the uh, minimum airspeed? How much do they, how fast do they have to go to be able to take off? Um, I think it's about uh, 60 miles an hour, 50, 60. And they, must be pretty, they must be pretty light. And what's the size of the gas tank and what kind of mileage typically? Uh, let's see. I think it's about a ten-gallon tank on ours. I can't speak. And is it uh, gasoline or is it air fuel? The uh, the Terrafugia uses a, uh, a, a gas Rotax um, fuel-injected engine, so it uses um, high test ninety-three octane. Um, so, hey, uh, yeah, Bill, Bill before, you, before you go, you, I'm just doing some quick math. You said it flies at about 100 knots, but you need 60 miles an hour to take off. And if I do the math, you got about a mile or two an hour between 100 knots and 60 miles an hour. Is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think that was all knots. No, 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 knots. no, no. Knots are, knots are much closer. They're not kilometers per hour. Knots are nautical miles, so it's they're. Oh, 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 oh you, you're right. So, I was doing kilometers. My yeah. bad. <laughs> so it's it's closer than you think. Steve, um, take that out of the uh, the video, will you please? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Shame on me. I've made that mistake I myself. A, so <laughs> I have a question for Bill. Yeah. Uh, did the turn you go have two engines, one for the car and one for the aircraft? No, I, I can get to that a little bit later, but there was, uh, it's only one engine. And uh, the, the early ones, uh, so in this picture here on the top, uh, you'll see this one here on the right, uh, which is the first model, 2009. Uh, and then the second model on the left, about 2012. And both of these had a, a uh, mechanical um, clutch that would switch the power to second set of drive shafts. So it would no longer turn the propeller, it would start turning the, uh, the wheels through a transmission. And so the, that was the, the primary. So it's just, again, the one engine running and that, that was very stressful on the drive portion of the uh, airplane. So the one on the right, uh, don't quote me on this because I don't want, I want to be nice, but it, it didn't fly very well. And in fact, I, it, it, late in his retirement, just a few years ago, because I knew people at Terrafugia before I joined Terrafugia, um, I brought my dad over to take a look at it. And this was sitting in, in their, uh, in the one of their high bay areas, and he took a look at it, and he had a very similar reaction to his reaction to the Convair in 1947. He looked at it and he said, "Well, that's not going to fly very well." 
<laughs> and uh, it, the person who was giving me the tour of Terra Fugia said, maybe your dad would like a job here because it didn't fly very well. <laughs> um, and he was 90 at the time. So uh, uh, there was a lot of improvement and real, real aerodynamic work on the, uh, the second model here. And then on the, 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 so that's the 2009, if you're interested, or maybe after, if, maybe we'll do that later, but I can bring these, uh, these YouTube videos up of it, driving, uh, filling up with gas, going to the airport, extending the wings and flying. Um, but there, there are some videos available there. So we can, if we run out of time, we can, you can do that on your own. Um, the, the current, uh, this is actually not the current one. This is this is the same as this, but basically the the new one, which is down here on the, on the left, is similar uh, in all the shapes of the current one, but the design changed for the drivetrain. So the drivetrain in its current form is with a, a generator on the drive shaft. So when you throw the clutch uh, for drive mode, it, it locks the propeller, but it, it now is turning a generator, which goes to a, a small lithium ion battery pack. And then your accelerator pedal drives electric motors. So it's, a, it's just one of the reasons why they wanted me there because I had a fair amount of experience on hybrid electric drive. So. The, the current system is a hybrid electric drivetrain. But again, the, it's the, the electric is generated from the, uh, the single gas engine. So the, the uh, Terra Fugia started from some MIT students. Uh, they won a comp, uh, I think it's a business competition at MIT. They got a $100,000. Uh, they signed up a few people who are interested in, in their concept. Uh, they very, and they got investors, uh, further investors and people put down deposits. Everyone wanted their flying car, uh, rich people. And, um, and they finished their design and built this in really very rapid amount of time, really a, a testament to a lot of excellent engineering it's not easy putting together something that complicated that you will that you can get um, license enough to get an experimental sticker to fly it um, and a lot of the Excuse flights me. were done uh, yeah unlike um, most college type things these um, these pictures look like a very well manufactured product that would require I would think, pretty expensive manufacturing equipment. So did, did Terra Fugia have that kind of gear or did, was everything just subcontracted out? Um, I think, I don't know all of the history, but a lot of it was made, uh, uh, I'll say in-house um, originally. So there were people who are, um, I know that there were groups of, at MIT, because I had worked on some electric vehicle, electric race car teams. People were very good at composites and putting together molds and composites. Um, and so it, it was a lot of the same techniques that some of the electric vehicle and race teams at MIT used. So was this so body I, metal or is, it, or is it a composite? Um, I think they're all composite. There are metal parts in there. I mean, like Beach uh, Aircraft put together a whole airplane, which, uh, which I saw and I picked up the whole front of the airplane with one hand because it was yeah. just composite. Yeah, the, certainly on, on the later models, they're, they're all composites. I actually haven't investigated, but I think these are all composite also. And the, the suspension systems are, are rugged. Um, metal. Um, the, the wing root down in here is titanium uh, and those get sent out. They're, they're designed and they're sent out for, for fabrication. 
uh, their, their propeller components, things like that are all uh, commercial parts. Um, but this one here was, was much more uh, handmade, uh, more of a college project. Uh, the second one was there was much more funding and material available and uh, was, was made with molds that could be repeated. Uh, so the, again, the first one is around 2009, the second one, 2012, it flew much better. Um, They're both mostly flown up in Plattsburgh. Uh, and Plattsburgh is an old Air Force base, so it had a very, very long runway. So you can safely test fly um, for a while at about five feet off the ground there. You can take off, fly, get an idea of your flight capabilities, and then land it safely without getting much altitude. Uh, the, the, the current airplane, the, the, uh, the current TF-1 uh, down here is up at Nashua, and the, um, there, because the runway isn't long enough to do that, uh, when you take off, you've got to get yourself up to 3,000 feet very quickly so that if anything happens, uh, the, the ballistic parachute for the aircraft or the pilot wearing a parachute can get out safely. So it's a very different test flight envelope uh, for safety sake uh, in Nashua than it was out in Plattsburgh. So what happened was the, uh, you know, the company sort of got this idea that there was a very limited market for flying cars. Uh, and in the, I don't know, by 2014, and determined that there might be a much larger market, including DOD, if they had vertical takeoff. And so most of the work for a number of years before I got there shifted to this TFX concept. And there, was, there were models made and RC models flown and uh, a lot of modeling done to, to complete a design there. So there are flight controls uh, being worked on simultaneously with airframe design. And uh, that was about the time that they ran out of money and uh, Geely Holdings in China came in and purchased Terrafugia. And there was a lot of rework of schedules and goals. Uh, and the, the, the focus changed to be towards, again, with vertical flight, but more towards this three-part system. Um, so originally, I think it may have had six vertical rotors, but safety analysis uh, you have to be able to survive a, a motor failure and still be able to land all your passengers safely. And that, that turned out to need eight rotors. So a lot of the systems you'll see out there in the press have eight rotors for that reason or more. Uh, and then the, it was deemed that there was simplicity at having two fixed drive rotors for forward flight. Because once you're forward flight, your lift is provided by the wing. You don't need your, your vertical propellers anymore. And a, a whole team, including the founders, moved out to Petaluma, California, and um, um, started work focusing on this, while another team was left in Woburn working on the regular flying car, the TF-1. And then um, about two years ago, the company moved the uh, vertical takeoff work to China and shut down the Petaluma office and uh, really only fund, we're funding in the US, the, uh, the TF-1, the flying car. They wanted us to finish it up, get it certified, prove that we could certify things. And then they would see whether we would then take over the TF-2 and get that certified. Um, we did take it to certification last year uh, or earlier this year, got, got the full FAA 
certification. And um, then they've instead moved this design to China. And so they'll be doing any further work on it. And no more is being done in Woburn, which is sad given this lovely history here. Um, Bill, Bill yeah. one qu quick question. Uh, when the wings are folded, can it go through a toll booth? Uh, yes, but luckily there aren't any toll booths anymore. But yes, it can go through it. Yeah, there are plenty of toll booths. Uh, but yes, it was designed to fit in a standard uh, garage. So it has to handle all the, the height uh, issues or the height restrictions of a standard house garage. Um, and it, at, at the very end of, for, for flight envelope testing on this, uh, this first bullet point, the, our flight assessment vehicle, um, we flew quite a bit and, and our climb rate and stall speed were very, very close to the requirements. Um, we did, but we didn't really have any margin and there was a possibility that the FAA would, would not approve those because there's a little bit of subjective um, interpretation of those rules as you translate your actual climb rate to sea level and so on and so on. Uh, so it was determined that we needed longer wings. So very quickly, uh, the team uh, added a foot to each wing, which meant that when it was folded, it stood taller and would no longer fit in what had in 2009 was deemed a standard garage. Um, and so there was a little bit of, of a violation of that original company requirement. Uh, still very plenty of headspace for uh, toll booths, but um, our justification for that was, well, only rich people <laughs> will be owning these things. And if they needed to, first of all, they, they probably have uh, you know, at least one minivan with a, with a rack on the top and they probably have much bigger garages than people did, especially in Lexington, uh, than they did in 2009 in their brand new McMansions. So um, we, we were okay with that to, to um, make sure that we were well in excess of the FAA climb rate and stall speed requirements. Um, so one of the, uh, I, we built a flight assessment vehicle, um, so full final envelope uh, to get all of our FAA required uh, uh, operation. We flew around a hundred hours up in Nashua. Uh, from my my team's point of view, we we had uh, there's probably about a thousand wires in there that all have to be correct um, and well connected and handle all the avionics and electronics for flight. Um, and it's a, it's a chore that was done in probably put together in six or eight months um, during 2019. And we, we had the very close support because uh, every flight something happens. Uh, after the flight or during the flight. So we, we built telematics uh, system for it so we could monitor it from the ground. And uh, it was really pretty exciting getting, uh, watching those, these uh, takeoffs, landings, uh, supporting uh, spin testing. Again, you put a, you, so you put a second parachute, drag chute on the vehicle to run your spin tests in case it's unrecoverable. Uh, you can throw out another uh, chute to help spin recovery because our goal is to keep our pilot alive. Um, but everything worked out very well. In fact, the, the, the dual tail design uh, was essentially spin resistant. So you, no matter what our pilot tried to do to get this thing into a spin, he really couldn't do it, which is the FAA is also happy about that. So it either has to be able to easily recover from a spin or be spin resistant. So 
with all that work with uh, our flight assessment vehicle in 305 TF, uh, we started a full certification effort at the beginning of 2000, uh, which you can imagine uh, was trying with uh, COVID restricting uh, all of our movement and a lot of our communication. Uh, and the, the, you get one piece of certification that allows you to run as an experimental vehicle. You, it has to be inspected, it has to be deemed safe to fly uh, and so on. But for full certification from the FAA, that means you can start producing and selling a product. So it's obviously much more rigorous. FAA wants to see that every part has a drawing. It's been reviewed and signed off by design and by a quality organization. Uh, we have about 1500 drawings. Um, and you can't start building anything uh, until those drawings are all complete and signed off. So we weren't really able to start building uh, this next vehicle until about September of last year. Uh, and then while that was going on, you also need uh, a full documentation and path of requirements and then test records and procedures. Uh, so all of the physical component parts had to have full stress tests and so on. Um, so, you know, wings were set up with 4,000 pounds of weights on them and uh, deflections tested and so on. But there's, a, there's an awful lot of work. Thankfully, these, the documentation and the drawings is something we could do remotely. So there was a, there was a fairly productive effort last year, uh, getting all these things done, uh, getting things signed off, a lot of reviews. And then in September, started building, doing system setup, debug and test. Really, the debug and test started in November. So, you know, one good thing about doing your documentation is that things tend to go together better. And so instead of about a six month build test cycle for the, the flight assessment vehicle, the, um, the 301 TF, our, our certification plane, really came together in four to six weeks. Um, so we, we did our flight tests up in Nashua. That's my foot right there on the bottom right picture. Um, and one of the big findings from the FAA review was that the lettering had to be bigger. So that was, that was with the FAA. After all, all of the review of all these documents and drawings and the flight data, uh, the one thing we had to change was we had to make the lettering larger. So this is the large, this is the larger lettering. Um, and so anyhow, it was a very successful program. We got, uh, uh, got our certification. We had a big celebration. Most, I think all of us got bonus checks and then the next week, everything was shut down. So that's, that's how business works these days. <laughs> I can, I chuckle. So, so is anybody buying these things? I mean, you have deposits, but are you delivering anything? Uh, uh, short answer is no. Uh, the, when we got certification, um, so between January and February, we were on a path to build uh, two vehicles for, one for China, uh, one for here, uh, and then a few test, full test setups. Um, and then we were gonna be finalize our drive uh, components, which we had been doing separately all during 2020 on a different test vehicle. So um, yeah, we had started volume production uh, contracts for building about five sets of electronics and other components. But uh, that all came crashing down in, uh, a couple of weeks later. So 
So none were none have been built. There's there's the one we will be sending two of they're they're actually probably flying today. I don't know what the weather's like in Nashua, but they're they're they'll be flying both of those airplanes for a little while longer. They're doing a little bit of tweaking on some a couple last designs before they send everything to China. So there there is a skeleton crew still at um, Terra Fujia and Woburn. And other plans to work on some other uh, vehicles. So, so, so this has happened because the Chinese bought the company. Is that how it worked? No, our impression was that the the fact that the Chinese bought the company made them more interested in in uh, spending money. And the last last year, we had had a pretty good three year plan on on doing work on this particular. Uh, TF1 design. Um, so I think it has more to do with the global economy of the of Geely Holdings. I can only speculate, but uh, I think it was just it was costing a lot of money, right? You got a full team of engineers and a few buildings, and um, even if we did sell a few, it would just be a few. Uh, so mostly you're spending some number of millions of dollars uh, to keep all that design work going. And uh, our impression was that they, they valued that enough to keep that going until there was uh, some volume production capability. Um, but it may have been that uh, they, because they were uh, maybe losing money because the people weren't buying Volvos. Geely also owns Volvo Motors. Uh, people weren't buying as many Vol Volvos in 2020 uh, that they had some budget shortfalls and they felt they could close the gap by shutting down operations on flying cars. I will say that uh, Geely has made, uh, recently announced a joint venture with Volocopter. They had been an investor uh, indirectly and then directly with Volocopter, uh, which is the, the picture in the lower right, uh, for a few years. And so it may also have been at a high level, then they deciding, well, do we want, do we want to go forward with the Volocopter or transition from the TF1 to the TF2 and the number of the amount of dollars it would take to do that in Massachusetts. Hey Bill, is, yeah. is there is there any technology inherent in the uh, in in your the product you worked on that could be transferred elsewhere and actually have some use outside of a, uh, a you know a a, a a flying car type of thing? Is it stuff that could be used elsewhere so that the company may have bought technology as opposed to product? Um, uh, maybe. Let, 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 uh, the, me say, the main, the, let, let me help you out and say, in your opinion. Uh, in my opinion, and, and it had been for a while, the, the main element there was the hybrid drive. Uh, in that you now have your gas engine, which is, which is very good at, at uh, certain parts of the energy spectrum uh, for your, your application. Uh, and then you have the ability to run a generator and do certain things with electric drive. And, you know, as you can see on the Volocopter, uh, you're not going to put mechanical linkages to all of these rotors. You're going to have a cable running to ele an electric motor. And so the, the, it was clear in the industry that all of these vehicles will end up having electric motors, and they all do. Uh, and then the question is, do you run it off a battery or do you run it off of a, uh, an engine that's, uh, that's driving a generator? And so we always felt that that core technology is something that was really valuable. And then the other core value to Geely, we felt, was having a team that knows how to get a vehicle certified, which is, which is really difficult. <laughs> and... Uh, it took years of training uh, and process to get it to that point, even though the, the final push effort 
it was pretty much a, a one year effort. Um, the people there were really professional about it for, for their work for the number of years beforehand, design reviews and design documentation and so on. So I thought that, that with this screen, I'd talk about some of the different vehicle types. So generally the terminology for what Terrafuji is building is a rotable aircraft. So it's really designed to fly. And then secondarily as an afterthought, if you need to, you could drive it. You, know, you could get it to the airport and you wouldn't want to really drive it around, but, but it's got value as a rotable aircraft. So those are the, the TF-1 and the PAL-V that I showed you before. Uh, and then another vehicle type is an air taxi. So this is something that's really intended, and people call these flying cars, but they're, there's in no sense are they cars. Uh, they just act like what the Jetsons used. Um, so Volocopter is this one down here on the lower right, and you can see it's, it's got small, the nice thing about finding components is there's a lot of small motors around, uh, and having lots of them uh, allows for safety in case one or two of them fail in a flight. And they've done a number of flights in this volocopter. Uh, up above is Ehang, which is a Chinese company, and they have done a number of autonomous flights in China and Singapore. Um, and they have an interesting view, which is they're using. Um, contra-rotating uh, propeller sets on each of these arms. So it may look like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, but it's really 16 uh, propellers. And the nice thing about the contra-rotating uh, sets is that you don't get the torque like you get in a helicopter. Uh, so you don't need a tail rotor to keep it from rotating. Uh, so, as long as you're running them in sets, you could, you could have uh, a few of them fail and you still don't have a, a rotating, rotational problem if one of them fails. So the Mars helicopter stole this technology? Yeah, I mean, people have been using these on toys for 20 years, but, uh, and, and other helicopters have been using this. Um, command, K-A-M-A-N, yeah, contra-rotating. Uh, in line rotating propellers are very noisy. Uh, they, yeah, they can be noisier. There's a lot of negatives about them. There's also, a, uh, from my research, uh, you can get more lift if you've tuned them properly by having them together. So there, there are some benefits to having the contra rotating props um, if they're designed specifically at specific feet. So that the distance apart uh, that the rotors are and the design of the propeller and so on. But there's, there's a lot of, and there's also a space savings um, by having the country rotating propellers. Uh, but the uh, noise is a big issue for these things because you want the, the whole idea of urban taxis is they're urban and you want to land them where closer to where people are. So noise is a big deal. Uh, and to that end, uh, the next one on this air taxi list is Joby. So they're, they're, Joby is probably the subject of the largest chunk of investment in the last while. I think um, there are a bunch of investors in another SPAC, one of special purpose acquisitions, uh, have put in $6.4 billion into Joby. And they're not trying to sell vehicles. They are creating something like Uber as, a, as an air taxi service. So it's a very different financial model that they're looking for. But they've had some flight tests there and there's some videos of them recently that they've released where the founder is talking about you know, his, his business and, and and how well the, the plane is operating and it's taking off and landing right behind him and it is quiet. So that's really what they've designed their, their vehicle for is simplicity, ease of use and uh, acceptability for use in urban environments. 
So that'll be, a, they're really a, they're really the company to watch in the space. Yeah. What kind of range do you get? Because when you talked about your product, it was only 10 gallons of fuel. Um, I think something like the Joby, they're looking at a few hundred miles, maybe, maybe 300 miles. And I know some of the electric airplanes are looking at um, something like 400 miles in range. That feels and, like and a they, lot more than 10 gallons though, doesn't it? Well, horizontal flight on a, on a winged airplane is very efficient, but they will have larger fuel capacities or they'll just have larger batteries. Um, so there's, there's a lot of these are battery mostly. Now at the risk of, uh, of raising a, a strange subject, isn't this like a flying bomb? I mean, you, you've got something <laughs> relatively small with 10 or 20 or 30 gallons of gasoline in it. Um, I don't know uh, what the rules might be for pilots and passengers. It's no different than any other general aviation, I think. Uh, to me, one of the big differences is that uh, a lot of people look at these propellers and say, those are for lift. And, and I look at them and when they're talking about an urban environment and you have to think about them as rotating knives. So uh, yeah, I'm sure, I know that the FAA is very, very concerned about, uh, you know, if these things go out of control, they would cut uh, power lines, telephone lines, uh, any kind of any kind of lines in an urban environment in a neighborhood. Um, and if they also, you know, you, these things are strung up. They would take off your head. They would take off limbs very quickly. And so, if you look down here, I, and I, I'll jump ahead a little bit to the last one on this list is the Bell Nexus, and this is partially marketing. There's not a huge aerodynamic advantage for putting these large um, cowlings around the fans on this Nexus. So these are, this is a tilt rotor, uh, six rotor uh, aircraft that they've been showing full scale at trade shows. Uh, but this is for the impression of safety around that. And I, I guess the only other thing I'll address on your comment about a flying bomb, uh, number one, uh, most of these are electric. So your, your, probably your bigger concern is your lithium ion pack will catch fire and that'll be a fire danger. Um, personally, again, my opinion, one of my, one of my concerns about autonomous driving vehicles as well as autonomous flying vehicles is that uh, terrorists like putting bombs into certain things and you could almost, if, if there wasn't a driver required, you know, someone could drive 30 autonomous vehicles to the White House and set them off. So there's real flying bombs. Uh, and then the, the air, you know, as a, from a marketing point of view, I'm sure the, our Air Force and Marines would love the concept of flying bombs. Um, so they cool drones about... and we have them already. <laughs> the army is so, already using flying drones. I mean, that's that's been standard for probably close to 20 years. It has, it has. Uh, and, and so I, I, I put on the, the cargo drones because really these are, you know, the, the things that I'm showing on this page are, are vertical takeoff. So that's one of the differences uh, between what the drones they're flying now and, uh, and these from a technology point of view. So these are, these are sort of a drone technology for vertical takeoff. Uh, and, and this is the one that's captured my imagination more than any of them. Um, and that's this, this one here, this is a four rotor uh, tail sitter. Uh, so this thing, the, in, in, there are, some that have the tilt rotor. Uh, there are some that just fly like drones. 
there are tilt wing aircraft. I'm going to get to this on, on the next page, but this is really interesting because it, it, the entire vehicle tilts. And because of this and, and some of the things like Joby, because they can tilt uh, the entire aircraft, they don't need to take off at, to a very high altitude, which means you're not wasting a lot of energy on your vertical part of your flight. You're getting to aerodynamic lift quicker, which means your range increases. And, and the sort of the, the, the fourth piece are these multi-purpose air taxis like the Terrafugia TF2. And even that three-part idea is, uh, I've seen a few articles lately of a few other companies that are doing something like that. And so this page is a little bit about some of the, the, the designs. I'll try not to repeat myself too much. Uh, the PAL-V and the Terra Fugia uh, are using folding wings, but it's really a conventional aircraft. Uh, Volocopter, E-Hang that we looked at, uh, the Volocopter style uh, and the Bell Flight with the big rotors um, are a multi-rotor drone style. And then Joby, which is this one here, uh, the V-22 Osprey, uh, those are tilt rotor. So the, the wings stay the same. In this case, it's the whole engine, which is really awkward uh, and caused lots of problems for the V-22. That's been around for probably since the X-22, what was that, mid seventies. Um, and finally got fielded probably in the late 90s uh, where it was almost reliable enough for troops, continues to have crashes or continue to have crashes for a number of years. Uh, the Joby is, because they're electric motors, the motors and the propellers are a lot lighter. So it's a lot easier to control. Uh, and I think the control software has improved quite a bit lately because of all the drone, commodity drone software has made this kind of uh, flight very, very simple and safe. And so they, they don't seem to have these problems that the B-22 had during its development. Uh, then there's tilt wing. And let me, so Transcend is a local company that they're doing a lot of design work. They're also flying or like they're, they're testing up in Nashua. So we've seen some of their models running up and down the, 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 the uh, runway there. But it's a tilt wing and it, it's got some simplicity advantages um, over the tilt rotors, I think. Um, but they, they're looking at, I think about a 400 mile range with uh, four passengers. And then I just read today that uh, Lilium went public with a SPAC worth about $2.4 billion. And they've got a whole bunch of little fans uh, and they all tilt. I think the whole wing rotates. Uh, it looks kind of funny, um, but they, they take a certain aerodynamic advantage. They, I think they call this a jet, but they're little electric fans in there. And, uh, but because they're blowing over the wing, they get some ex extra aerodynamic lift from blowing air over the wing. So it's, a, it's an interesting, design that Lilium has. And then there's these tail sitters, um, like, so this is with the Bell uh, APV-70, it's cargo, but you could see that it could scale up where this was a passenger compartment um, in for flight. This is also the APV-70 and its current cargo configuration. So it's a pretty big vehicle. Uh, and you could see that, Bell, because you know they're they're old, an old school helicopter company with a tremendous production capability. They could probably scale that up easily if they needed to. That's one of my favorites of of the designs, just for its sheer simplicity. And then there's the uh, multi rotor pusher vehicles like the TF two um, Beta up in Burlington, Vermont is also. Uh, flight testing some full-sized uh, vehicles, their beta. 
and it's it's similar. I think it has six rotors, rotor pods, and then the one pusher on the back. So you can see there's there's a you know it's it's like it seems Darwinian. There, there's a lot of different variations on uh, the designs, and and some of them will have advantages for for certain things, uh, ship to shore cargo, um, other short haul cargo. Uh, I didn't show it, but the the Amazon, um, the, the latest Amazon uh, drone, package delivery drone is actually fairly similar to the APV-70, although it's a hexagonal shaped with six uh, propellers, but it's also a really a very well-designed uh, vehicle. Uh, one of the other things is variety of fuels. So uh, we were talking a little bit before about you know energy density of various things. So Terfugia gasoline, um, PAL-V is the gasoline. Um, it's very versatile. It's high energy density. There's not a lot of carbon savings uh, when you're using a gas engine. So, um, <laughs> You, you could you can argue, and some some of these companies do. Well, you're not idling in traffic. So if you were flying between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, for instance, or Los Angeles to San Francisco, um, you wouldn't have to deal with all the traffic, and that's true. So there's there's a little bit of savings from that, and plus, presumably, if you had a, a, a five seat or a or a ten seat uh, airplane. Um, you're, you're getting a mul the multiplier factor like you would get in a bus that's driving. Your, your miles per gallon per passenger uh, drops off. Uh, a lot of these are being designed as hybrid electric. Uh, if you look at the, the Bell aircraft, uh, their, their Nexus with, with six big rotors, uh, there's, there aren't, uh, electric, there's not an electric pack big enough to let that thing fly for a long range. So what they're, they were saying is they're gonna start with a hybrid electric you know, gas engine with a generator um, because all, the, all the, the rotors are electric motors. Um, and then as, as the uh, batteries improve, they can make the uh, engine smaller and smaller until it's all battery but they, they have some flexibility because the drivetrain is all electric. And that's very true. So there is, there's some energy savings again. Uh, you don't have to plug it in and charge it at the airport, um, or maybe you do or you can, but uh, you have the advantage of flexibility moving forward as the technology changes. And then there's a bunch of uh, all electric vehicles. So, um, this, if you've read that uh, Cape Air has put purchase order in for, I think almost a hundred uh, aviation electric airplanes. I think they're ten seaters, um, all battery powered, uh, but they need a it's very high carbon savings on that. Uh, it's a relatively low energy density. The batteries are heavy, uh, and uh, Cape Air will need airport charging infrastructure if they're flying from Logan to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. They'll need, they'll need to charge those things up, something the equivalent of a Tesla quick charger. Uh, but those planes have, a, those are the planes with the 400 mile range. So there's some real capabilities there. Uh, once you get flying, um, you're pretty efficient. Um, and then some of them now, there's a, there's a few that are working in fuel cells. So it's not quite like the Hindenburg uh, because it's they're liquid hydrogen in tanks uh, and the tanks are, there's stronger and stronger lightweight tanks available now. Uh, it's a company called Doosan, which is I believe this one here. It's a very awkward looking thing, but I don't know, six, maybe five, five passengers uh, and uh, rotors. And I'm guessing the fuel cell package is here. And there's some very uh, tough looking uh, containers 
with hydrogen here, but uh, they're also getting well-funded. And uh, Alakai Sky, I think they're centered out of Hopkinton. Um, and they're also running uh, more of a drone type vehicle with hydrogen. Isn't having hydrogen on there more dangerous than having gasoline? Uh, generally, no. I, I, I remember in, when I was in high school, I did a lot of analysis and uh, literature analysis of uh, fuel cell electric cars. And the, the tanks are, uh, they're under high pressure, but they're extraordinarily safe. Um, you have to remember back in history that the Hindenburg did not explode. Uh, the, if you read the, if you ever see the, the, uh, the Nova programs on the Hindenburg, the problem with the Hindenburg was that it was coated with essentially solid rocket fuel, which they didn't know was solid rocket fuel. They thought it was a stiffener for the rubber of the uh, skin of the Hindenburg. So when Hindenburg caught fire, it didn't go up like a fireball. It basically stayed in place um, in altitude as the skin burned. And then only after the superstructure melted did it come crashing to the ground. So it, the hydrogen itself did not blow up. Uh, there were sparks that ignited what later turned out to be basically a rubber solid booster fuel on the outside. Uh, but in general, hydrogen escapes high up out of the way very quickly and tends to be fairly safe in an accident. Um, that's not to say, don't, don't say I, I told you that would never happen in a, in a high-speed accident on a fuel cell car. But I think Toyota has done pretty well so far with their more eyes, their hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, in Japan and in California, uh, even though I don't think they're selling them to anyone. Uh, but I think they're getting a lot of miles on them and I haven't heard of any safety issues. Um, but, but yeah, it refuels quickly, very high energy density. There are a couple small drones that are being used um, uh, that are being successfully used uh, because, they, because of the high energy density, they can have tremendous range. So there are some small drones right now that they're using for things like transmission line inspection. You know, and if you wanna check all the power lines between San Francisco and the Oregon border, which are you know, ultimately responsible for some of those fires in California, um, you, you want a plane uh, or a drone with cameras uh, that has very long range and you're sure we'll go there and come back so you don't lose it. So there's, uh, there's been some good samples of, of hydrogen power these days and we'll see whether, how, how that viability goes. So uh, I'll, go, I'll go, let's see if I go, I won't go back a page, but um, you can see there's a, there's a variety of, of fuel sources also associated as you're looking at these. And then I wanted to get into reality check. I'm running sort of uh, um, ah, sort of running on power here, but okay. Uh, FAA certification is difficult. <laughs> these are the reality check. So all of these companies they have uh, that are doing test flights now, they have experimental licenses for the most part, and it's going to take them a while to get uh, Part 23 certification on these. Uh, we received our FAA certification uh, for light sport aircraft in 2021. Um, probably the, the most interesting of this bunch of getting to certification quickly uh, is Ampere, which is doing a hybrid electric. Um, it's this up here. They're putting an electric motor in the back and leaving the, the whole certified um, gas, you know, jet or uh, it might be a turboprop uh, engine and the rest of the airframe is already certified. So all they have to do is validate their, their electric boost for propulsion. So they can save, they can help on takeoff and, uh, and a lot of the high, uh, high energy um, modes of the airplane and save a fair amount of gas. 
So it might be a 25, 30% savings uh, by going hybrid. The other reality check is, so if you're making a, uh, if you're doing a, uh, an Uber-like service, you need a lot of pilots. Um, and so you need to train a lot of pilots to do that. And there's, there's a shortage of pilots these days, let alone for five passenger vehicles like Uber. Um, and so another is the FAA hasn't created flight corridors yet. So you're not gonna use this from your driveway. Uh, the vehicle might be like the Jetsons, but our homes are not like the Jetsons. We don't live in high rises um, that are convenient for a Skyway uh, highway. Um, so heliports, uh, regional, you know, like regional transportation centers like, like up in Woburn would need to be built all over cities. And uh, that's gonna be a challenge. And otherwise, you know, if you get into the Anderson RTC, you know, over by the Burlington Mall, uh, well, now you still have to get and take a shuttle bus into Boston. And that's a pain in the ass. Or how much are you gonna spend on your flight from here to Burlington or to New York City if you have to do those four steps? Uh, and then you've got to integrate it with a taxi hail service of some sort to feed all these new heliports. So there, there's a lot of certification associated with creating new heliports. I'm sure the FAA has to determine how you can safely run between Hanscom and Logan and the entire New York City area uh, with all these vehicles in the way. And then the 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 relief for the pilot training is autonomous only flight. And so there's, there's a lot of technology that's needed. Obviously you need the corridors if you're <clears> gonna <throat> enable autonomous only flight um, that, that the rules would have to uh, conform to. So I wanted to, to, to sort of end up with, well, how difficult is that gonna be for the autonomous? Uh, flight, and I will say that that there are there are companies that have pretty robust autonomous driving capabilities now. Companies like Mobileye and, and Delphi, and they've got lidar and and cameras, and they for and some of these only cost a couple hundred dollars per vehicle. So BMW and Mercedes, and I think Tesla use a lot of this technology, and they're pretty good at autonomous driving. Um, they have, they can do situational awareness and identify, this is some modeling of some of the software, but they can, they can see where all the other vehicles are nearby and anticipate pedestrians, bicycles, things like that. Um, so they're, the technologies, I don't know if you could say, it starts to feel like it might be 10 years away or less. Uh, but FAA now has to be involved and create these air traffic corridors. And, and I, I've, I've been able to find that there are a lot of these corridors already mapped for existing airports, uh, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot more that would need to be done depending on where people are actually flying to and from. So maybe an order of magnitude uh, addition within the FAA to create more tunnels in the air um, you'd have to train the vehicles to stay in those corridors. Uh, and that's probably not too difficult. They're, they have GPS and, and other means of determining where they are. Um, one of the advantages for something in the air is that you don't have to deal with other drivers. Uh, the FAA would probably be able to require this on any, any vehicle that was doing air taxi work. So if you added communication between vehicles, uh, you'd really only have to deal with other vehicles with the same, that are riding by the same rules. Um, and then you'd be able to train them collaboratively to, to avoid crashes in three dimensions. You could, you could guess that with this mobile eye in Delphi, if you added a camera above and a camera below and had communication vehicle to vehicle, you'd have a pretty good idea of your situational awareness. So I can, I can envision a path 
to getting there. It's just, I think, not anytime soon. So I, that was really the end. Um, I went over a little bit, I think, but uh, any no, There's uh, no going over. You're, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill, I have a question. You guys yeah. have full certification, uh, but then, you, you know, the company went um, uh, down. What's the value for somebody to pick it up, essentially, where you guys dropped it off? Uh, I think there is value there. Um, and I, I think, you know, Geely is really, for the last, whatever, four years, has been our big investor. So I think, you know, they're the ones who, who are maintaining that they want to hold on to that value. So okay. I, I think that's, that's the conundrum with Terra Fuji right now, is that uh, I don't think they want to shop it around. Um, either they want to use it at some time in the future. Maybe they'll see how Volocopter works out. Um, but I think they want to keep that technology to themselves. Uh, okay. I think if you if you look at the at, at the this world of air taxis, um, and um, there's really much higher value at vertical takeoff than there is at driving to the airport, in my opinion. And so I, I think, you know, completing and, and working on a folding wing airplane that can drive is probably less valuable than moving forward with vertical takeoff. Well, I would think that the defense department would be very interested and in, uh, they probably are spending zillion of dollars to, to work on that. Uh, they are, but uh, well, on they're probably more interested, even they are more interested on the vertical takeoff part, yeah, even the, uh, the, the technologies there. Uh, they already have helicopters. And so any of these services doing even these urban taxis, you know, there are there are services in midtown Manhattan and lower end of Manhattan like Blade which will fly you vertical takeoff to many destinations already. Uh, so it's really a matter of making it quieter and making it a little more efficient, making it a little cleaner. <laughs> and, and that's what they're, that's the market they're flying. Uh, by the way, the, the uh, Bell Aircraft is one of the leaders in one of the, uh, uh, the air, I don't know if it's the Air Force or the Army, uh, their new technology. But they have uh, some of the, the new Boeing and uh, Bell uh, military helicopters have a lot of these technologies in them. They have, a, they have rotors and then pushers and a little more wings. So they can go fast, they can shut the rotors off and run as an airplane for higher speeds um, and higher efficiency because they're getting lift from the wings. Uh, and but they also have the big helicopter rotors for vertical. So where are all your engineers? Have they uh -huh. gotten jobs elsewhere, uh, or you know, where they picked up? Um, the company, yeah, I, uh, the people are scattering to the wind, as they say. Uh, okay. The other bad pun I say is that uh, the flying car business has its ups and downs. But uh, yeah, the people are finding jobs and other ones who want to stay local are looking at the robotic companies and there's people looking at iRobot. Um, uh, there's a few people have gone to Joby uh, because there's a lot of money there. Um, and there's people looking at some of the other companies around that are doing this. Uh, again, people who want to stay close, they're looking at more of the robotics kind of work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and there's a few people sticking around because what the company has had, had been directing its attention to are these uh, long wingspan drones for doing uh, inspection work. So there is some activity with some of the lead aerodynamics folks 
and airframe folks to continue to work on that technology. But it's a much smaller effort. Have the founders stayed with the company or where are they now? Uh, the founders, um, so after Geely bought the company, the founders started, were the ones that moved, the founders that were left were the ones that started the office in Petaluma, California, and were working on the TF2. And then about, about two years ago, shortly after I arrived, uh, uh, Geely shut that down and the last of the founders left. So they're, they are working at, in some of the California companies doing uh, either short takeoff or vertical takeoff, electric vertical takeoff vehicles. Mm -hmm.